Hi everybody, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel, and today I would like to have a very candid conversation with you about something that if you've been in the industry, if you if you're an aspiring artist who's, you know, you're 15 years old and you want to become a professional artist or you're, you know, 35 and you've, you know, you've you've had a, a quite a bit of a career or you're, you know, or you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s and you've had a long artistic career behind you, chances are you have experienced more than once um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, okay? Um, but before I get to that, you're going to notice I want I want to draw attention to the logo on my shirt right now, okay? This isn't a Lucid Pixel uh, logo. This is the Schoolism logo. This is Bobby Chu's Schoolism, okay? And there's a very good reason for it. There's a very important reason for it. Now, am I wearing this because Bobby, you know, wrote me an email and asked me if I could wear his shirt to do some, you know, product placement or, you know, cross promotion for his school? No, he has no clue that I'm doing this, okay? This is this is a very strong statement on my part, something I want to say, and it and it and it very much illustrates. In fact, it completely illustrates what it is that I want to talk to you about today, okay? And that is the artistic community that you are a member of right now. This huge huge artistic global community that you that you live in but before I get to that I think what you need to hear especially if you're young, a little bit younger okay is um, a little bit of history a little bit of a history lesson on what has brought us to where we are today I take you a little a little bit of a trip sorry gardeners outside um, always when I'm recording if I take you back about 20 years, that's about how long I've been working professionally, okay? In different types, I've worked in, in animation, I've worked in, you know, as a director, I've worked in gaming, I've worked in film, I've done a little bit of everything, okay? Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit of my history. And you might be thinking to yourself, when, when you see me online, when you're watching me on YouTube or listening to me talk about art and career tips and all this kind of stuff, you might think, oh shit, Adam's really got his shit together. He really knows what he's doing. He's so successful. He must be rolling in dough. He must, be, he must lie in a bed of $100 bills, you know, and, and cackle maniacally to himself at night. I get emails like that, you know, oh, you're so, you're so successful and everything like that. Um, and sometimes I have to laugh and I'll tell you why. My career, if you, if I, if I look back at my career, my career was was very far from being a cut and dry success. In fact, the majority of it, I can be honest with you, the majority of it was more struggle than anything. Struggling financially, struggling morally, struggling well, morally, not as in I'm not an immoral person. I try not to be, at least. <laughs> None of your business. <laughs> I struggle, you know, financially, I've struggled morally as in, you know, I've been very down, I've been very depressed about my career, I've been very unstable, all of these things. I might have named the careers I've had, I've, I might have mentioned that numerous times in the past, but one thing I haven't spoken about is the negative space of my career. What happened between those jobs, okay? Because in my opinion, they are far more definitive of where I am today than my successes. My failures have been a far greater contribution to my career than my successes. And there's a very important reason why, okay? I started off, I studied, you know, classical animation because I wanted to be, I was one of those kids that wanted to be a Disney cartoonist. I knew that when I was five years old. And then I went to, I went to, I studied fine arts in college, uh, fine arts in college and then classical animation in university. And then I went into the industry, but then that was, the worst time in the world to go into into a 2D industry because the world was was going through a transitional phase between 2D and 3D. So I didn't know where the hell to put my feet down, okay? I could not find work in 2D. I managed to, I don't even know how the hell I did it, but I managed to find a few jobs, you know, working in this game studio and working in that game studio, and I found a couple of jobs. But that dried up real fast. So I ended up, at the time, I felt very much forced into learning 3D. Okay, and I got I got 3D, but then the first job that I had working in 3D, the guy was a complete complete shyster. He, he you know he he paid, I think it was minimum wage. You know, uh, that's how much I was making. So it was to the point where I, I just it wasn't realistic for me to stay because I wasn't making any money. You know, and I, I went on to other jobs and other jobs and other jobs. But how how much space were there was there between one job and the next? Well. It's not, if you think that I went back to back to back to back to back to back to back and I was jumping from one studio to the next, that's not how it worked. In fact, there were very often periods, long periods of unemployment between these jobs, okay? 
And every single time that I got laid off, every single time that I got sacked, every single time that, you know, we the, the company would hold some meeting with, with, you know, with half of their staff and say, we're sorry, but we got to let you go without warning. Okay. When that happened often enough, it almost, for me and for all of my 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 peers all of my colleagues threw us into a state of pa immediate panic we were you know planning a vacation we were planning on you know upgrading our computer we were planning on doing this we we're planning on doing that and all of a sudden somebody just pulled the plug so we ended up hoarding what we had to save what we had because now we're counting the bills we'll say okay this will help pay my bills for the next two months or whatever the case might be and everybody was thrown into a panic mode trying to find new work and i know every time that i was i found myself back on the block i was i was my immediate instinct the next day was i have to update my portfolio i have to in, improve my skills i have to add some new skill to my skill set right i have to do this i have to do that and i would bust my balls to try to get, you know, an improved CV so I could, you know, increase my chances for my next for my next run of applications, okay? Meanwhile, I'm struggling financially. Meanwhile, you know, um, if it, you know, if I if it wasn't for the support of family or or close friends and stuff like that, I wouldn't have made it, quite frankly, okay? I depended on them to help sustain me so I could find other work, okay? I have other I have some people telling me keep going keep going Adam you're doing great I have other people saying dude just you know work as a cashier work as this work as that and on a couple of occasions I had to get work as a waiter I had to get you know I had to I remember once I was working at Sprint Canada you know I, you know I was doing all these different jobs just to pay the bills because there there was no work for me to have Furthermore the world was different than than it is now internet you might not realize this if you're younger but the internet wasn't always there Interesting. Hmm? <laughs> so how was that? How did that change the world that we lived in? How did that make the world a different place? Well, at the beginning of my career, earlier on in my career and my education, my community of artists were the artists in Montreal. Because we did a lot of what was the, 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 the term we coined was studio hopping. Okay, That was a commonality. It was a household term for artists. Because we did a lot of studio hopping, um, uh, when things sucked, when things weren't going well, okay, we had each other to turn to, my community, my Montreal artists. We ended up getting to know each other really well. So if I was working and one of my, one of my friends was, was struggling financially, I would very often get that call in the middle. Oh, yeah, I'm, this is, by the way, how we used to hold a phone. <laughs> you know? I'm not talking about rotary phones. We're not going back that far, but although I did have those too. You know, this guy, hi, Adam. Yeah, I'm really sorry to bother you, but... Um, I, I don't have any food in the fridge and uh, I'm kind of hungry. You know, so come over, I'll cook dinner for you. You know, six months later, hi, yeah, it's Adam. Um, I don't have any food in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, 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 come over. I, you know, I've had friends crash on my couch because they couldn't, they couldn't, you know, pay for the rent. I've had friends who needed to eat, you know, and we fed each other. We were there for each other, not only, you know, to help them with, you know, financially if necessary, not only to help each other. Uh, with food, but to help each other morally, to help each other artistically, to help each other professionally. When I found myself back on the chopping block and I wanted to improve my portfolio, I was just, you know, within a within a 24-hour span, I had to, you know, redirect my whole thought process, my whole life, my whole life path. And I'm realizing how the hell do I improve myself? And I would have a friend call me up and say, "Come over to my house. We'll go over your work together. Well, I'll help you out." And I had some very skilled artists sit down and help me you know, improve my portfolio. And I did the same for them. We needed each other to get by. We needed each other to say, keep going. Okay. And if, if it happened that this didn't happen a lot, but if it did happen that any of my artist friends decided to give up entirely, then we supported them in whatever decision they made, you know? And if my friend wanted to go back to school and get a degree in something else so that he didn't have to deal with it anymore, it wasn't worth it for him anymore. Then we supported him in that too. Okay. But what was immediately evident was the fact that we needed each other to get by. It was a real community. And another event that is, isn't actually art related that really drives this, this whole message home was I remember back around the turn of the 21st century, around 99 or something like that, uh, there was a really bad ice storm in Canada and I think parts of northern US as well. I think it was east, like around Quebec and Ontario. Um, an ice storm that hit... Montreal, I'll speak on Montreal's behalf, um, that knocked the power out for weeks or even months for people. You know, 
this much ice had accumulated on the ground because the, the temperature kept shifting between plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. So the water froze and stuck and it was very heavy, dense ice. Trees were collapsing, you know, entire, you know, uh, you know, uh, electrical towers were crumbling like a stack of cars. It was, it was quite surreal. Montreal looked like a post-apocalyptic city. You could go downtown. I remember taking a walk downtown, which is, you know, you know, Montreal's a big city, right? Walking around downtown and it was pitch black. It was dead. It was completely silent. No buzz of electricity, no neon lights, no cars driving. It was just barren, okay? Now, what happened during that period? Well, one of the first, one of the very interesting realizations I made during that period, because this only dawns on you after you've, after you've experienced this for longer than a week, right? When you haven't had power for longer than a week, is our homes with all the fancy trappings we have, our TVs, our computers, our microwaves, our fridges, our radios, our lamps, everything is completely useless. It's, com it's complete garbage without electricity. Electricity is the thing that has transformed the entire world as we know it, okay? As soon as you pull the plug on the electricity, our homes are nothing but unheated boxes with beds in them. That's what you realize. And before you know it, the food started to run out. Before you knew it, you know, we hadn't taken a shower in a couple of days because, because you know, the water was ice cold. We ended, up forth we ended up kind of having to take a shower at a certain point because you just can't live with the discomfort of not bathing for three or four days, you know. But what the remarkable, the, the great thing that did happen was how the minute we didn't have the security of electricity in our homes, we immediately had to leave our homes and start looking for help from other people. Our dependency on our, on our neighborhood, on the, on the people around us, was immediate. And I remember, one, I remember one, one night that really stuck out for me was I was walking down the street on a street that had ice this high. That's why you couldn't even use your cars. And besides, you know, using your cars, half of the cars were, had branches that you know, fell on top of them. I remember seeing one where an entire tree went right across the street and a car was wrapped around that tree. The wheels were pointing out this way, as if somebody had taken a car and wrapped it around like a bull. It was absolutely surreal. So you're always making sure not to stand under any branches because you could hear it overnight because everything was silent. So you're, so you're always paranoid that a branch was going to fall on you. You're walking on this slippery ground. All the trees is like a, it was like a crystal palace. You know, all of these trees that are bent over the street. And you're walking down the street, and all of a sudden, these people that have lived on 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 my street for the last you know, 20 years I, that I never met, I all of a sudden started to meet and immediately offered help. And they offered me help. And then I remember there was this one guy who said, well, come up to the corner because the, there was a pizzeria, a pizza shop up the street called Kent Pizzeria. It's not there anymore where um, the guy who owned the pizza shop kept his restaurant open so that he could cook pizzas on a hot plate, a gas powered hot plate and serve lukewarm coffee to people who needed to eat for free okay i had you know people that would help me and my you know help me get up the street we were holding each other i was holding hands with some strange guy you know so we could get up the street so we didn't fall down you know all of a sudden we really started to depend on each other as a community and that was exactly the same feeling i had in the artistic industry especially in my community but my community was just montreal and slowly but surely, my friends and my, my colleagues, my, people who I, who I hold very dear to me today, okay, help me get through that and help me claw myself out of that pit. Then something happened. There was a second wake-up call that happened to me because I slowly started to pull myself out of the pit. But then the internet started to become a regular thing. Then, you know, you know international communication became instantaneous. I mean, th this started to become a thing at the beginning around you know around that same period and i remember the day i went on to uh i remember this um i remember this 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 moment in my life very distinctly it was kind of the feeling i got when i went from elementary school to high school i was you know it took me six years to become the senior in my elementary school and i felt like a big hot shot for one year and then the summer vacation came and I came back to high school. I came back the next year and I went to high school. And all of a sudden, I was thrown back to the bottom of the pile. You know, it's kind of like, here we go again, right? I went to concept.org um, for the first time. And I remember how I felt the first time I saw that splash page with like thousands of very skilled artists. And something dawned on me at that very moment that 
although it took me this long to make a name for myself in my community, my community, or my city, Montreal, was no longer my community. Now my community was global, okay? And I'm looking around going, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of artists out there that all have incredible skill. And I immediately felt like I was thrown back onto the bottom of the pile. It was a very unsettling feeling that I got. Did it stop me from painting? No, because I'm an idiot and I don't know any better and I'm stubborn. But it, it was hugely discouraging. It made me feel for, for, for a long enough while, it made me feel very much alone, very insignificant. There's so many other great artists out there. How am I ever going to make a name for myself? That was how I immediately felt. And that followed for a little while. Until, until this happened, okay? Bobby Chu started his Chu streams. Darkin started doing his, you know, he started doing his online videos. Chris Oatley started having his podcasts, okay? Um, Anthony Jones started to do his thing. Uh, Samantha, Yusuf, Samantha Yusuf started to do her thing. All of these artists started to come out of the woodworks. People with a lot of ex with years of experience started to come out of the woodworks with years of experience. And they started to share their stories and started to share their skill with people in the, in the, in the online community. Okay? But furthermore... What I valued the most wasn't only the fact that they were great artists and that they were teaching very valuable artistic skills. And in some cases, these people were professional teachers. Like Bobby Chu is a professional teacher. He taught at Sheridan College, Canada's you know, number one animation school, right? He taught there for years. Um, he wasn't only sharing his skill. He was sharing his story. He was sharing the reality of his life. He was sharing... He was basically... He had the bravery and the compassion to hang his dirty laundry up and say, we all have dirty laundry, you know? And that immediately made brought that sense of community, that feeling of community back, that there are people to turn to. There are people that have been through it. There are people that understand and can help me get through it. There are people that I can listen to and people that I can, that I can find comfort in listening to while I'm painting, while I'm sitting there questioning whether or not I should continue in this goddamn industry. You know, that's what's going on in my head. I'm listening to Darkin and Darkin is describing the artistic process, not as, well, this is how you do it, little boys and girls. No, he's describing it as, you know, I probably have to do this about five or six times and, you know, I always screw this up and I really don't have a lot of confidence with hands, so I need to use reference and no, no, no. He's being very humble and realistic about the whole artistic process. I have people like Chris Oatley that are coming on talking about subjects about the industry, about the reality of the industry, about taking creative approaches to different... He, he's a thinker. He's very good at playing with... He's very clever with thought, you know? Listen to guys like Matt Kaur, who's exquisite at explaining things, at teaching, at explaining things in a way that anybody can understand. And furthermore, <clears throat> taking all of his skills and graphic design and animation and, and digital art and all of this thing and creating a free online resource for anybody, okay? To, you know, Samantha Youssef, who's a freaking Disney cartoonist who creates a school to help teach people how to, how to, how to draw, who, bring, who brought that quality of training into Montreal, okay? A gift that is immeasurable, okay? And the list goes on. Okay, Feng Zhu, who comes on and talks about his industry and, and from Singapore and how, you know, and, and, w and the reality. So he's the blunt guy. He's the guy who said, this is the real shit. This is what people are expecting from you if you want to work as a designer, you know, and making a strong distinction between being an artist and being a designer. And what is it to be a professional and what is it to be somebody who likes to, to who's more of a fine artist? Okay, all of these people are coming out of the woodworks and they're sharing their stories. They're sharing the reality with you. They're sharing the resources with you. And you don't realize how much of that stuff, how much of their time and energy and compassion and, and all of these and resources that they're sharing with you for free. Think about Noah Bradley. He goes on a vacation to the Grand Canyon. He travels around the world, takes thousands of high resolution pictures and then comes online and goes, here you go. Take it. It's all yours. Knock yourself out. Okay. Enough image references to last you a lifetime. And he just handed it out to you for free out of the goodness of his heart. Okay. On top of all of the incredible art that they've shared and the technical skill that they've had to teach. Look at Anthony Jones and he starts his robot pencil school, okay? Look at what he's contributing. I've, I remember 
when he first started to become public and where he was artistically. And there was a little, I took a little bit of a sabbatical from certain artists. I was kind of focused on my own stuff. And a couple of years, I wasn't really following artists that much. And I came back a couple of years later and I went, whoa, <laughs> look what this guy's painting. And furthermore, like his school and everything like that, I'm sitting there going, holy shit, these guys never gave up. You know, they just kept going. And this is amongst layoffs and financial instability and all of these things. And what they came online to say is, this is what you need to get better. I have the tools. I've been through it. I know what obstacles you have to deal with. This is how you're going to, and we're going to, we're, we're going to offer you all of this stuff for free. Not, well, not for free. Well, a lot of it for free, but a lot of it for an incredibly affordable price. And what I'm witnessing happen today in the industry as a teacher, because I don't only have my online school, but I have, I teach in, in at the CJ Pavel of Montreal, my home away from home. These are my kindred spirits. Every single time I walk into that school, I go, <sighs> I'm home. I just actually went to see, uh, 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 a couple of days ago, I actually went to see the, uh, the graduate gala. You know, they, 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 they do all of their 2D and 3D, their, the, the graduating students' films at the end of the year. And I walk back into the school and the energy of the students and the talent of this goddamn talent of these students and the teachers. And I'm sitting there going, you know, I just want to hug every single person in that building. You know, I, I, they totally think I was a creep, but that's how I felt, you know. And, you know, I'm looking at them and the sacrifice and the incredibly hard work that they that they provide, the hard work of the students going there and busting tooth and nail every day, you know, pulling all-nighters day after day after day to get these assignments out and to produce their best work. Teachers that just are the most selfless goddamn people on earth, just the most generous, selfless, and freaking talented people on earth that are giving so much of themselves for the shittiest salary imaginable, okay? Teachers, and now doctors, and now dare, daycares, at least in Canada, freaking government, excuse me, don't let me, don't get me started on that, you know, have been suffering financially, you know, are need to keep, upkeep the, the, the infrastructure, need to be able to pay, you know, to, to support their own families and their salaries keep getting cut and cut and cut and the funds, their funds for the school keep getting cut and cut and cut. And now they're trying to do another cut. Okay. And I'm sitting there going, the government is crippling the educational system. Okay. And as much as I love the school that I teach in, I fear for it as well. I fear for all of these great schools around the world because who has to handle the brunt of this cost? Well, the teachers do, the students do, okay? Taxpayers do, right? You know, the, the government puts people, squanders millions and millions of dollars and they, they, turn to the, they turn to the people and say, we all have to support each other with through paying ridiculous amounts of taxes. The system, as I'm watching it, and as I'm sure everybody else is witnessing as well, because it's, Americans say the same thing, Australians say the same thing, Africans and shit, the Greek, you can see how, how, how our friends in, in Greece are suffering right now, places in the United States declaring bankruptcy because they don't have any money left, okay? I'm not going to get into the whole financial talk about things, but you see where things are standing right now, and it's scary. And for artists who have always kind of been at the bottom of the food chain as far as salary is concerned, you know, my mother who studied fine arts at the time, she ended up learning, she ended up getting her, her degree in computer science, but um, when she was younger, she was a fine artist. She was, that's all she was. And they used to refer, they still do, I think, sometimes, they refer to a Bachelor of Fine Arts, a BFA, as a Bachelor of Fuck All, right? Because at the time, you know, selling your paintings was pretty much the only way to make a living. Now we have video games and, and film and special effects and all that. So the market has grown. But it's still hard, right? And, you know, and to come from an industry like that and to see how hard things are. But then, while that light is dimming, another light is starting to shine. A light called Anthony Jones. A light called Bobby Chu and Kea Sidera and and Alex Wu and, you know, Tom Fluharty and Sam Nielsen and, and, and Nathan Fawkes and Tyler Edlin and Darkin and Samantha Youssef and all of these people are starting to come out of the woodworks and saying, it's okay. You need a place to crash? You can come crash on my couch. That's basically what they're saying. They've taken this small community and turned it into a big community, but it's still a community. It's a support group. And you know what? More than ever, we need it. You need it. I need it to survive. Okay, we need it to move forward. The fact that if I need help, 
I if if I don't know where to go with my career, if I can, if I don't know how to, if I don't know what kind of a portfolio to build, I don't know what kind of artwork to produce, I don't know how to find my style, I don't know how to create an effective application, I don't know the legalities. The fact that there's somebody out there that's that that's willing and has the expertise to be able to answer those questions for me, not for fifty thousand dollars, not for a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, for a couple of hundred dollars, okay, is a gift from heaven. Because this did not exist. This didn't exist. You paid for the local school you had. You dealt. You you were dealt the education that you had available to you, and that was it. You made the best with what you had. And in many cases, it sucked. But now you can pick and choose whoever you want. These selfless people created are rebuilding the industry on their own. They've converted huge, huge businesses that are becoming, as we're witnessing obsolete hopefully not completely obsolete because there's a lot of good that comes from brick and mortar school system there is good but that's dwindling fast okay hopefully that'll reverse hopefully that'll change but they've taken this pile of shit that we're living in and they turned it into diamonds for all of us to to enjoy okay they need your support you need them okay and what they're offering you is is priceless so if you have a chance to wear their shirt, wear their goddamn shirt, because pe you need to know more people like Bo more people like Bobby Chu need to exist. More people like all of these people online that are out to help, or people like Stephen Silver who started his 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 academy and who goes on every week and shares his thoughts and shares humble stories to help you feel better. God damn it, spread the word, okay? <clears throat> and with my school, <clears throat> excuse me, and my school is. Wouldn't exist unless I, I, was, I was given that great example from, these, from the people that I look up to, that I have a huge amount of respect for. I don't have respect for them as entrepreneurs. I don't have respect for them as elite or as being great artists. They are great artists, but that's not what I respect them for. I respect them for being great people, compassionate people that are out to help you. But there's something more important you need to realize. If you're 15, if you're 5, Probably not. You probably don't have much of an online presence if you're five years old, unless you're, uh, you know, honey boo boo. <clears throat> but, um, you know, if you're 30, if you're 40, if you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and you're part of this community, <clears throat> sorry, do I have any coffee left? Damn it. Tim Hortons, baby. <laughs> <clears throat> but if you're a member of this community and you're going through struggles and you're, and you're you know, at whatever point in your life, be it pre-career, mid-career, or end of the career, and you have experiences, and you've been through your share of struggles, and you've, you've, you've found your way through it, and you have thoughts and feelings to share with the world around you, share it. There is always somebody out there who needs to hear it. And you might be thinking, Adam, let's be honest. I'm 15. I haven't even worked a day in the industry. Think about how many other 15-year-olds there are globally. Remember, your community isn't your little neighborhood. Your community is the whole world, okay? Confided. You don't want to be too public if you're under 18, okay? You do have to be careful. Make sure your parents are helping you with that. But think about how many other artists are out there that need to hear you express the fact that you don't know where to go with your career. Express the fact that you're insecure about your artwork or express or exp just share your artwork and show you show them where you are artistically. Okay. People need to hear it. People want to hear the real stories. There's only so much showing off of great art that has value to it. It only has value as, as far as as far as the lesson it's as, as far as the demonstration is concerned. But that's not what you will carry on in the long run. That's not what's going to hold weight for you on the long term. What will hold weight for you in the long term is every time you start to feel like, God damn, I hate this, you know? I've got bills to pay. I've got collection agents following me. I'm sick and tired of being on UI. My UI expires in two weeks. I don't even know if my if my freaking portfolio is good enough. I have to feel like I have to start from scratch. Am I in the right career place in the first place? I'm, you know, I'm sick and tired of being supported all the time and you're sitting there feeling really shitty and stupid and miserable and, you know, having a big pity party. But you can go on and, and read The Perfect Bait and hear Bobby Chu say, I made books that never sold. I applied to companies that never hired me until I fed, eventually got fed up and decided to take matters into my own hands. And that's what made me who I was today. But I never gave up. And you go, 
all right let's get drawing you know I'm good now you know I needed to hear that you're not alone and you need to understand that you're not a little microscopic speck in this vast universe of people no your voice is will transform other people's lives you need to be heard if you've spent the last 60 years of your life working in a career and it's been just a series of goddamn struggles your whole life and then the industry changed where traditional illustration, you know, I was, you were, you were doing great and then the industry changed and everything went digital and you didn't jump on that bandwagon and felt like you kind of got, all right, thanks for all your work and you got pushed aside and you felt bitter about that but then you found a way to, to get through that or didn't. People need to hear that, okay? We're desperate to hear that. Why do you think reality TV is so freaking popular? Okay? It's popular because it's <laughs> it's not realistic. But that's the closest thing to real humility, real humility, real real human emotion that we get because everything else is just Hollywood emotion, right? It's just fake stuff. It's superhero comes in and pew 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 and kills all the bad guys and everybody sings and dances and there's much rejoicing, right? People need to hear your voice. They are uh, yeah, you know, people like Bobby, people like Kay, people like Darkin, people like Tyler, people like, you know, Chris Oatley and Noah Bradley and Samantha Youssef. These people should be not only helping you get through your tough times, but they're telling you, you're a member of a community and we're going to need you one of these days. And they do need you. They need you right now. And everybody else needs you. Okay? You are not alone. And what you're going through, these struggles, these difficulties that you're facing, we've all been through it. And artists aren't the only ones that suffer. I have programmers that call me. I have lawyers that call me. I, you know, people that are in my entourage, people that are that are that are my friends that all took different career paths. For God's sakes, I have a financial advisor who called me up and who's struggling financially. C'est la vie, right? <clears throat> so don't sweat that. Just know that you do have people to turn to. And by God, if somebody sends you an email and says, you know, Samantha or Tiffany or Roger, I need, I feel like shit. Can you help me through it? You know then you take the time to answer that and give and always give your best because one of these days you're going to need them too so remember this quote because this is something that I've carried with me throughout my entire career be kind to who to those who you meet on your way up the ladder because you're going to meet them again on your way back down all right happy painting